Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be highlighting the work of three nonprofits that bring the arts to underserved community. Our special guests today are Shelby Williams Gonzalez, President and CEO of Inner City Arts in Los Angeles, and Michael Manson, founder and executive director of the Musical Arts Institute in Chicago, and Liz Hopfan, founder and executive director of Free Arts New York City. And let me just sort of set this up. Uh, public school uh, funding for arts has dried up as schools have increasingly focused on tested subjects like math, English, history, and such. And art is about dreaming, the joy of creation, no testable material here. So uh, let's, let's talk about public school funding and how it conveys a, a, a message. And, and uh, if you all could start just sort of commenting on the importance of art to young people, the importance to, of art to a strong civil society. Shelby, can we start with you at Inner City Arts? How do you see the importance of art in our public schools and in, in our children's lives as compared to a subject that is testable like math or history? Um, how, how are, what is your perspective on why art is something that you would dedicate your career toward advancing? Well, I think first and foremost, arts, the creative process only lends hand to all, as you said, testable subjects, right? Because with any art form, whether it's a visual arts, performing, mixed media, digital, right? You can go in any realm, but it's really about the creative process that I think lends its hand to any subject. Um, we're teaching young people to try things, to challenge themselves, to take risks in a way that that is a, a, teach, a, a soft skill that goes across any platform. So that's really, I think, the importance. And it's, that's why it's important in the education and a holistic approach to young people as a whole. They should have a place where they can try things. Um, and take creative risks, whether they pursue the arts fully um, or is, you know, it's something that is of a hobby to them. So your point is that is that in order to um, encourage creative thinking, out of the box thinking, uh, uh, risk taking, right? You, you cannot just learn technique, the technique of doing a math equation or the technique of writing a grammatical sentence. You have to get beyond that you have to get into the creation without bounds. And, and I guess that's that's part of what you provide at Inner City Arts? It is, I think you, you can break, I like to break it down as there's form, function, and then freedom, right? F understand the form of any any uh, art form that you desire from, you know, I can take, for example, I have a dance and choreography background and I learned the techniques of ballet and modern dance and uh, West African dance. And then you learn the function of those movements. And then it's within that freedom that you really then blossom into finding your own voice and using that, that means to really tap into yourself and share that part with, with the rest of the world. It's sort of that improv improvisation that brings us uh, to music. Michael, I didn't mean to suggest that, um, that uh, music technique is not testable. Um, I, I certainly, or dance technique for that matter, Shelby. Um, but um, when, when, you're, when you're bringing music to, uh, to your young folks in Chicago, uh, Michael, how do you approach this? Um, or do they approach you and tell you what they want to learn? Well, I, I think it's both. And uh, uh, like you say, there are skills that are testable. So it's not like we're, we're in a bubble and we're not, we're free form totally. Um, so, uh, but just like you were talking about, you know, there's there's room for improvisation. There's room for interpretation. I mean, even in the most classical forms of music, you know, uh, where you're just reading music totally, there's still room for interpretation to being yourself. And uh, I, you know, being, after being a musician for over 40 years, you know, I've learned that I, it's impossible for me to color inside the lines. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I, I know how to color inside the lines, but I just can't stay there because I'm free and I, I'm free to express. And we're trying to teach children to do the same thing, to learn the skill set, 
And then after you've learned the skill set, you know, stop thinking about it and be free and express yourself. Um, who do you serve, uh, Michael? Who who in your um, in your community uh, mm -hmm. uh, are, are part of uh, the Musical Arts Institute's family, as it were? Sure. So uh, we serve about twelve hundred kids on the far south side of Chicago, and um, uh, our target student is around sixth or seventh grade, and uh, you know, interested in expressing themselves and interested in learning art. And uh, that's our target student, but I, we expose music to about 1200 kids a week though. But then we are looking for those who are really, really uh, have a, a affinity for music and, and arts. And, uh, and we really want to take them to the next level as well. Shelby, what is your footprint? So we are, we're based in Los Angeles, right? Uh, just on the outskirts of downtown Los Angeles. And we are a program that really serves K through 12 and a little bit beyond. Our in-school program is primarily with elementary age, uh, the K through fifth or sixth, depending on what part of the county you're in. Um, and then we have additional programming and self-select programming for high school students. Um, and we're looking at, you know, we serve, uh, around 5,000, my number is a little off in, in our in-school program, but quite a large footprint um, of folks coming onto campus, obviously pre-pandemic, but also still through virtual learning. And Liz, I love your the name of your organization, Free Arts. It has so many different meanings, right? Free Arts, Free Arts, and Free Arts. <laughs> Talk about Free Arts in, in New York City. Um, yeah, I mean, similarly to, I think, um, probably more inner city arts, um, we serve a, a wide range of kids, really from age six to 21. Um, so we have been working with a lot of kids who have now been part of our program and have graduated high school and are in college and studying art. And, you know, actually, we are building out a pretty strong alumni program to be able to support those kids continually. Um, we don't work directly in schools. We partner with different schools, community centers, social service agencies. Um, we work a lot um, for our elementary school age program. We work a lot with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, obviously a population that, you know, this past year was in dire need of programming. And while we couldn't do anything in person for them, we were sending monthly art kits and activity packets and things like that. But, um, you know, similarly to what I think Michael and Shelby said, it's, it's you know, art is about risk-taking, about challenging yourself. Um, we have a motto, there are no mistakes in art, um, which is super sweet with the, with the little kids, you know, everybody, I think it, um, to hear them say that um, at the beginning of a program or something like that is, is very freeing, um, obviously as you get a little bit more into the fine arts, there are some mistakes or there's a little bit of right and wrong, but we like to sort of have that as our overarching motto. Um, so can we talk a little bit about the idea of discipline, right? Keeping time, being on time, right? Cre finishing a work that you started, right? The discipline of the selection, whether it's the paint or the step or, or the note, um, talk about how uh, the arts, Michael, informs a young person's approach to their own life and how that can actually uh, connect neurons that within the boring confines of a classroom with four walls and a, and a little boxy kind of a thing uh, might not be conveyed. Sure. So there is uh, the discipline of music. Uh, is, is the skill set. Um, and it does take some discipline. It does take some repetition in order to learn the skill set. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of, there's, you know, a lot of problem solving that happens. Uh, uh, I've heard it said that, you know, musicians make the best mathematicians because we learn how to problem solve. Uh, and so, uh, and then the repetition of breaking things down and to find solutions and then repetition over and over and over. That's the discipline of music. And once you get that, once you have that discipline, then, uh, then you're free to apply that discipline and be free. So I, um, 
I tell my students, you know, you, you practice until you don't have to practice anymore. Uh, you, you apply the discipline until you don't have to do it anymore. Then once you, you don't have to do it anymore, you don't think about it anymore. You, you're free to be yourself. Uh, but until then, until you learn the skill set, that's where the discipline comes in, where you have to practice daily and you have to practice repetitiously. And like I said, uh, it, th those skills always transfer over. So you don't necessarily, after you've learned the skill and after you've learned how to improvise, you don't necessarily have to go into music full time, but those skills and that work ethic actually transfers over into anything that you want to do in life. And um, people are also working toward a performance or a recital where they are going to be showcasing their skills. So it really concentrates the mind. It is just like working toward a job interview, right? Yeah, or walking towards a deadline where you have working to be toward a deadline. <laughs> where you That's have to do a presentation. You know, it's like okay, this is it. We got to be there, and we have to be prepared. And uh, uh, so. You have to be on point and you have to, you know, practice your craft until you get it, you know. And your deadline, Liz, is is a uh, is an exhibition and you have an exhibition uh, right in back of you. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we we try and do every year or we do every year is to have an exhibition of some of our um, young people's artwork and um, historically, it has been in person, but last year and again this year, we are doing it virtually. It actually, um, tomorrow night uh, on Sotheby's.com, they're hosting an exhibition for us and it'll be up for a while. But it is an opportunity for our young people to work towards, you know, having to put together or select um, one of their pieces, uh, create an artist statement, which is an important part of being an artist. We, we really primarily focus only on the visual arts. so. Um, uh, write an artist statement um, and and then obviously be proud to see it hanging, you know, even virtually, um, you know, on the walls of a major auction house is pretty exciting for them. Um, but our young kids are also, you know, looking to apply. We have a, a program for um, middle and high school kids who are interested in um, applying to specialized art high schools or to, you know, BFA or, or art focused um, colleges and so they have to work towards putting together that portfolio and they have to be able to select the work that is best and make improvements and um so they're working towards those deadlines as well you know to to be able to um to to go to where they would like to go but yeah it's it, it, it's so important that we uh, also are able to serve full communities there's a real issue um in particularly in the inner cities with homelessness or housing insecurity uh, poverty and so on. Shelby, how do you ensure that you uh, meet people where they are so that children are not disadvantaged based on the circumstances in which they need to grow up? Do you have uh, special programs and outreach to, to those who uh, live in insecure circumstances? Well, that's, that's tied into our mission on how we identify schools that we want to work with. We're really looking to partner with schools that don't have the arts on campus or arts already integrated into their curriculum. Um, and then it's working with administrators to make sure that, yes, they have some sort of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, skin in the game in terms of paying for our programming, but we have diversified funds to support that. So it's really starting, I think, at that, that basic level of the schools that we want to work with to make, to ensure that we are having the furthest reach. And then really doing outreach um, for students to then self-select to take additional programming. And something I just wanted to comment on actually in terms of uh, in addition to discipline that comes through the arts, right? And meeting those deadlines. I think it's, it's safe to say that the importance of being present is what happens in the creative process, right? You, you can't really phone it in if you're in a recital, you can't phone it in, you know, in a performance mode, but even just learning any sort of discipline Ah, Shelby's painting. Uh, Shelby, you just you just cut out for a second. Could you just repeat oh, that last sentence? So sorry. Oh, I just I just said that. Um, in addition to the discipline, whether it's performance or wheel throwing or painting, right? It's it's about being in the in the present moment, um, which is I think is so important because we've learned really well, especially in Zoom life, to multitask but uh, the arts brings us back to let's do one thing at one moment. 
Shelby's making such a such an important point, and you know, it's interesting, uh, Shelby, how you connected it to my question about uh, 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 lower levels of income, because I think that with the COVID situation, we have uh, uh, young people who might be living under difficult circumstances where there's a certain amount of trauma, right? Doubly traumatized, and then school had to stop. Triply traumatized. Liz, um, how do you ensure that you're reaching out to uh, to young people of all income levels and that they can actually pursue their art and be present and have a little bit of relief from from uh, their own worries? Yeah, I mean, that was an important part of, you know, what we did. We, we still actually are um, operating in a remote environment and have been since last March. Um, I shared that we're a uh, um, one of the largest um, recreational partners of Department of Homeless Services. And so over the course, um, and, and still we currently are doing that because they're not fully functioning in in-person programming. Um, we've been sending monthly art kits to uh, about 1600 kids every month, uh, along with activity packets and kind of fun cards that are inspired by different artists, um, you know, so that they can make art and, and have, um, have that experience, you know, whether it's because it brings them joy or brings them relief or just giving them something to do. So we um, continue to do that. We've connected with some of our community partners via Zoom, although, um, you know, sadly, the digital divide is um, is ever present in New York City um, housing, uh, for sure. And then, um, you know, really the, the teens in our program, um, all of them have mentors that they work with over the course of the year. And so we've been lucky to be able to provide, um, you know, kind of Zoom and Google and, and they were then been meeting virtually. We've done artist studio visits, you know, where an artist is in their home or in their studio and, and we can have, you know, 30 kids on the, on the call meeting with them. So we've, we've made it as accessible as possible. We've sent art supplies, you know, directly to our kids. We've, um, you know, put Wi-Fi in place, you know, and hotspots for kids who needed it. We gave out 40 computers to um, kids last year so that they could, you know, participate in programming and summer internships. So we're, we're trying to make it, you know, um, as accessible as possible. And I think, I, I think we've done a good job, or I should say my team has done a really good job at, um, at making that possible. Um, well, let's talk about that team, because so often the teams who teach are also teams who, uh, individuals who perform, right? Uh, they're, they're individual artists. Liz, is that true for your, for your teachers, for your staff? Are they also um, uh, uh, people who are working artists and educators and, and so on? Um, you know, our, our program is, um, like I said, all of the teens in our program have a mentor, um, and many of those mentors uh, may be a working artist by day, but they may be, you know, lawyer by day and just passionate about the arts or, you know, studied, uh, you know, have some type of degree in, in arts um, that they want to continue to um, give back to young people. My staff, definitely, we have some professional artists, some working artists. Um, and so, yeah, it's great for them to be able to obviously, um, you know, share what they do and their skills. Um, I personally have zero artistic skills. <laughs> I didn't have well, the appreciation the, for it, but. Um, <laughs> it's the collaboration of uh, amongst people with, uh, with different skills. We just took uh, uh, two polls. The first one, uh, we asked whether uh, art should have equal uh, ranking with testable subjects like reading, writing, and arithmetic, and uh, ninety-five percent said yes. Now it's a it's a select audience uh, here, but that's very interesting. And then the second poll was was also even more interesting. We we said how many days of creative arts, so visual, music, literary, dance, theater, and so on, should be required in the one hundred and eighty day K through twelve school year. And nobody said zero. In other words, everybody felt that art should be a required subject. That's, that was the important word here. 5% um, said uh, four to five, four and a half days of instruction, about 45 minutes weekly. 32% um, said nine instruction days or about 90 minutes weekly, right? And then 64% said there should be a minimum baseline and more for interested students. So. There is a lot of support here for arts, and 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 um, I would just assume that it is the basis uh, the basis for that support are some of the points that you've all uh, mentioned, Michael. Um, in terms of of your staff, your your uh, teachers, your volunteers, 
Are all those people uh, connected or, or many of them connected to uh, performance themselves and are, the, are they themselves uh, musicians? Yes, in fact, uh, one of our um, uh, training exercises and, and we just established some really, really stringent uh, core values for everybody who's on our staff is that they have some kind of a musical acumen. They have to have something going on. Uh, most of our teaching artists, we have 22 teaching artists, and uh, they are, not most of them, all of them are practicing artists. And uh, they are musicians, uh, some of them tour, some of them, you know, play in different uh, 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 venues here in the city of Chicago. And uh, so, and, and they are very, very good at what they do. Um, and then even our administrative staff has some type of music acumen where they know about music, even if they're not practicing professionals, um, they have to know exactly what we do and that's part of our culture. So that is very, very important to us to be able to, to, to speak music as it were. And, and Chicago is, an, is, is a great arts town. When I'm in Chicago, I'll tell you where I am at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> Kingston Mines. Kingston Mines, of course, right? because it's open to three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and you never know what you're going to get, right? I mean, you yeah, you have get, house bands, but it could be it could be great or it could be not well. Yeah, right, right, right. But no, I have many friends who work there at the Kingston Mines. And, and and let's not forget LA, uh, Shelby. Um, in terms of your staff and and the, I mean. LA, Chicago, New York, arts towns, my goodness. You know, the people who come through your doors are going to be, some of them are going to be tomorrow's artists, right? The young people who, who come through. So talk a little bit about your staff and, and, and where they come from. Sure, so part of, uh, we really promote having teaching artists, um, professional artists that are exhibiting themselves. So our staff is actually made up of working artists that are also educators. Um, we have exhibiting visual artists and dancers um, and every, even within our development and communications department, there's people that are coming from theater backgrounds, uh, musical theater backgrounds, as well as um, just uh, theater in general. So we're so pretty eclectic a, staff. And it's a support for the arts ecosystem in each of these, these towns, right? I mean, we've all heard about how uh, Broadway in New York and, and live performance in Chicago and, and in LA, theater in LA, that, that uh, people are really suffering uh, during this COVID time. So this was really a lifeline, a, a way for artists to continue to explore and share their gifts, right? Yes, certainly. Um, and I think the arts, you know, is a healing tool. It gives you the outlet to, to express yourself on any given subject. And we've really promoted that, you know, as we all here have had to pivot to online, you know, and virtual events, but also using the arts as a way to talk about what's happening in the world, right? To have a socially relevant topic and then use the arts is a way to engage around that topic. So I think that also makes for a healing space. Can we also talk about American civil society because we've all had to live through uh, divisions, insurrectionist activity. We've had um, uh, violence in the streets. We've had peaceful uh, protests uh, attack. We've had peaceful protesters uh, run over. Uh, can we just talk a little bit about how art uh, creates connection that allows people to bridge differences. Michael, how do you see the role here? When you when you look at your at your students and your faculty and so on, do you yeah. feel like you have are are you just about art or are you also about something else that that's important to America? Well, I'm about a couple of things. Um, uh, I think one of my biggest uh, missions is to 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 galvanize or unify a community, uh, to give a community self-worth. And then to, uh, once that community has some self-worth, then they are comfortable exchanging with other cultures. Uh, so that in, here in Chicago, we have what is called the Chicago Music Exchange, where uh, students from, from each side of the city or each culture has an opportunity to, to share uh, with uh, 
with one another, but you have to have something to share, right? So uh, you have to have some unified uh, things going on in your community, things that govern it. So I, our, our, one of our biggest uh, uh, goals is to have our ensembles that we have, which are pretty, pretty good at what they do. I mean, they're excellent at what they do, is to go around to the community uh, and do live performances and to make sure that the community sees excellence in the community and so that we can go once we've done that then we exchange with other um with other communities and then another thing and not to belabor the point but uh, another thing is to to recognize what's in the community and then the deficiencies that are in the community and then the lack of resources in the community and to try to to express that we want to have um, equal resources kids of all cultures are very, very uh, uh, talented. But we want to be able to show that no matter how, what, the, uh, what the socioeconomic situation is, that these kids deserve equality in the arts and quality uh, resources and, and good equipment and good teachers and all of that. So there should not be an, a socioeconomic gap. And uh, so that's one of the battles that we're fighting as well. And Liz, how do you see your impact on New York's civil society? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just getting into, um, into a post-election uh, phase where there are a lot of debates about uh, different positions, different segments of society. Um, and New York has always been a microcosm in its own way of, of America's uh, inner cities. Um, how do you see free arts functioning as a civil society organization, not just a, not just an arts organization? I mean, similarly to what Michael said, you know, I think that um, art is is a great equalizer. I think, but um, everybody needs to have access. Everybody needs to have the opportunity. Um, you know, that's really what free arts has been about since inception. You know, really leveling that playing field. Um, it's important. You know, for for um, for the community, for everybody, for, you know, young people to feel comfortable to walk into any, you know, cultural institution or into any gallery or to, to feel that they have that self-worth and that ability to be a part of part of it. Um, you know, there's a huge shift, certainly, obviously, across the country in even businesses and corporations to sort of help, um, you know, to, to create more equity. And, and so I think that that's really what, you know, we're, we're trying to do. And, and that's how I think we'll, you know, leave our lasting impact, certainly on New York, or certainly in the creative fields, um, you know, going forward. Well, we just completed another poll, Liz. It's very interesting. We asked people to answer um, uh, the a question of, do you believe that arts education is part of a positive impact on children in terms of we, we let people pick from a, from a list of about eight, eight different, uh, different categories. The three that got the most uh, clicks were development of abstract skills with application to other fields, including creative problem solving, decision making, planning, time management, and so on. And then we also got very, very large answers for reduced dropout rates, increased classroom engagement, reduction in disciplinary infractions, higher test scores, and then also development of motor communication and language skills. So these are all really important fundamentals, right? Sharing experiences for a civil society. Shelby, we're coming to the end of our time. So uh, let me give you the last word. If you were to admonish uh, America on, on how we should proceed and how we should view art, art education, um, equality uh, of resource, of access to resource, what would you tell us all in terms of how we should invest and how our tax dollars uh, ought to be used to create this soft impact on society? Uh, thank you it's for that. It's all on question. your shoulders, oh, Shelby. I love so. that. Oh, you know what? I'll figure it out. Here we go. I, I got the answer. <laughs> Problem solved by uh, 8.30 my LA time. Here we go. So, <laughs> so one, I think when thinking about funding the arts, uh, don't think of it as a as, as separate or a secondary uh, part of your curriculum, right? It is just as important. And right, I know I'm speaking to the choir, no pun intended, uh, but it's an integral part of, of 
of our school day. So as however you fund your math program or your language arts program, that's how you should be funding the art. That's how you should be funding any arts program. Um, I would also say this because the arts is creating that platform for social emotional learning. It's creating the place where we are helping young people come into themselves and then empathize with the rest of the world. So it's really on our shoulders in creating communities beyond just the walls that you, that you, uh, you know, respectively see. Um, so that's my uh, platform on how to fix the world. You need us artists, we solve problems. Uh, we speak out when there's something that needs to be changed, right? We're promoters of social change and we do it in a creative and fun way, so. Liz, Michael, would you, would you endorse uh, Shelby's uh, platform here? Yes. Absolutely, positively. Uh, <laughs> because... <laughs> oh, I think, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I guess the new buzzword now is like STEAM or something like that, where you have not only just STEM, but arts included. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of buzzwords, but certainly the arts is as important uh, and it, what does it do? It makes us even uh, more human, as it were. The arts makes, after you've learned how to be a, a nurse, what makes you human? The arts, being able to express yourself, being able to enjoy someone else's communication with you. That's what makes us human. And uh, so uh, definitely learning about it and being exposed to it. And it's just as important as calculus. So oh, thank you so much. You know, if we could, it, it, it seems to me that that Shelby's uh, platform, the Shelby Williams Gon uh, Gonzalez uh, platform for the arts is something that the Republicans, the Democrats, red states and blue states, conservatives and liberals, everybody can get behind. Why? Because it helps bring the country together. It helps individuals become more productive and gain skills and, and create joy. Thank you so much. Shelby Williams Gonzalez, President and CEO of Inner City Arts in Los Angeles, Michael Manson, founder and executive director of the Musical Art Institute of Chicago, and Liz, Liz Hopfen, founder and executive director of Free Arts New York City. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us today. Everyone have a great day, attendees Thank you. who Thank you. provided Thank you. questions. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Okay.